This is World's Greatest Con. I'm Brian Brushwood. I don't know for sure if this was my first one, but it was definitely an early one and the one I remember the most. A moment of inspiration. A moment when I knew something that nobody else did. I was seven years old, going through the Houston Post, looking for the comic pages, and there was a single coupon for four free tokens at Chuck E. Cheese. Now, dude, I loved Chuck E. Cheese. And my friends loved Chuck E. Cheese. Of course, we all loved Chuck E. Cheese. We were seven. But this is about the coupon. A real coupon. None of this fake buy one, get one. None of this buy a pizza, get some tokens. Straight up, you cut out this coupon and you got a dollar's worth of ecstasy. You got four games. You got to play Crazy Climber, Donkey Kong, Tail Gunner, and Asteroids. And they were just giving them out. And then I realized I might be the only person on this street who cared about that. And there was a lot of newspapers up and down this street. I didn't have the right words at the time, but now as an adult, I understand what I did was I formed a cabal of three co-conspirators and up and down the streets of Greenwood Forest in North Houston, we stole every copy of the Houston Post we could get our hands on and we were gods. As fun as spending those tokens was, It's the moment of inspiration that's the beginning of every great con story. The moment you realize something that the rest of the world hasn't seen yet. In the Bible of schemes, this moment is the book of Genesis. For example, you ever see one of those offers to open a bank account? Usually the bank gives you something to make sure that you bank with them. Maybe it's a higher interest rate, no withdrawal fees, or... Maybe they offer you money. Let's say $500 just to open an account. One day, a man in Ohio looked at one of those deals and put together that if you signed up for like 12 accounts and then waited the exact appropriate amount of time, when you withdrew, you would make a cool $6,000. That guy felt pretty smart. Exhilarated even. Shady? I guess. But let's say you get 11 friends and you promise them a small cut. How is it anything other than taking advantage of a system that's a little loosey-goosey, that hasn't realized that somebody as smart as you exists? I mean, going forward, of course, they're going to correct it. They'll shore up their system. They'll be better for it. Someone has to learn that lesson. You just get to be the one to teach it to them. In the 1970s, in Southwest Ohio, there was that someone at some bank, and he did teach them that exact lesson. That man is Michael Larson. Michael is no longer with us, but I'm willing to bet that Michael was addicted to that moment. As a magician, I've had just enough of a taste of it that I truly believe he craved it. He sacrificed for it. He went all out to prove that those little epiphanies could turn into something powerful. And one time when that inspiration hit, he found something that was totally undeniable. Stop! Stop at five! thousand and a spin. Michael, you have rolled 31 times. Stop! Four thousand and a spin. Larson realized that one television game show was being lazy. Just like that bank. He knew something they had yet to figure out. And by that same logic, he figures they're asking to give him money. They need him to correct their broken system. All he had to do was show up and take it. So he did. Put on a cheap suit, rehearsed a sob story, flew to Los Angeles, and amongst the bright teeth, wide collars, and chest hair of the TV industry, he won 
the biggest single day haul in the history of television game shows. An all time record that adjusted for inflation still stands to this very day. That one little schemer from Lebanon, Ohio, made fools of them all. He made the host of the show wonder if he was about to bankrupt the network. He landed half the executives of CBS in a conference room to study exactly how he was pulling this off. Now, while the money's crazy here, this isn't a story about money. This is a story of that moment, that moment of realization. Because unfortunately, once you've proven to yourself that you can pull this off, you can't help but try and do it again. And again, and again, and again. And the more you press your luck, the more you are guaranteed to eventually get the whammy. It's also a story of addiction because I guarantee you that even through everything he goes through in this story, the glory, humiliation, a run from federal law enforcement, you know he's thinking one thing. I can do this again. Cons don't fool us because we're stupid. They fool us because we're human. And this man, Michael Larson, might just be the world's greatest con. World's Greatest Con is brought to you by BetterHelp. If you heard season one of this podcast, you know that I very openly and honestly talked about the loss of my brother. Probably not a surprise that I started getting therapy afterwards. That's part of the reason I felt comfortable talking to you guys about it. If you're feeling disconnected, if you're feeling sad, lonely, and who isn't in this weird time that the whole world caught fire, do something about it. Get matched with a therapist in under 48 hours by going to betterhelp.com slash WGC. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. When you go there, you'll join over 2 million people who have taken charge of their own mental health with the help of an experienced professional. The service is available worldwide. No matter where you are, you get to be matched with somebody who can help make you the best version of yourself. You log into your account anytime, send a message to your therapist. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, so they make it easy and free to change therapists if you need to. It's more affordable than traditional offline therapy, and BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. So do me a favor. Take care of yourself. Go to BetterHelp.com slash WGC. You'll get 10% off your first month, and you'll be taking care of my favorite listener. Michael Larson is a very smart man. He's got these wild eyes, this irresistible smile. He's the guy you meet at a bar after the third beer and you become convinced that the two of you are best friends. I'm increasingly uncomfortable with how familiar this character sounds. But the difference is Michael Larson, no matter how charming he is, is a con artist. He's arrested three times between 1969 and 1982 by the Lebanon and Dayton Police Departments for receiving and concealing stolen property. Larceny by trick and petty theft. He went to college, yeah. Turns out it wasn't for him. When he saw college, he saw a bunch of people really excited to sit around and wait for things. The kind of suckers that Michael was born to teach lessons to. Now, of course, being smart alone doesn't pay the bills. Well, actually, one time it did. Michael registered a business under a family member's name, hired himself as an employee, then fired himself to collect unemployment. But still, he eventually does some honest work. He gets a certification in air conditioner repair, works as a repairman while also driving an ice cream truck in the summer. 
Michael is constantly scanning everything he can find for that angle, that moment, that gap, that trick. He reads the newspapers. He listens to the radio. And in the early 80s, he begins to become convinced that the next moment of realization is going to come by watching television. So he just parks his ass in front of the tube, starts watching TV, right? Sure. I mean, at first... He's not covering enough ground, is he? So he adds another TV next to it. Good evening. Washington leaders tonight have worked out at least a temporary And another one stacked on top of those. Then another and another. Because of a funding impasse in Congress. As for the long term, the Senate has finally approved its spending bill for the new fiscal year, but still has to work out... Ten televisions all on one wall. The heat from the fans are melting the wallpaper behind them. And the whole time he's thinking, it's got to be here somewhere, somewhere on TV. Press your luck. One game where there's virtually no limit to how much money a player can win. Wait, now let's learn a little that's something weird. About the three very He's watching Press Your Luck, which even by the standards of early 1980s game shows, looks a bit shabby. Three contestants battle in a trivia contest. Winning answers get them spins on what's called the big board. Basically a ring of 18 squares that loop around the logo of the show. Lights flash around each of the individual squares until the player who initiated the spin hits the button to stop. Now, most of the squares have cash prizes, trips, or free spins. But at any time, four of them have a whammy. Whammy's a bad guy. Cartoon embodiment of the bankrupt tile on Wheel of Fortune. And just like that tile, the result is the same. You hit a whammy, and everything you've earned goes away. On top of that, making it even more chaotic, not only does the light ring jump around, but the squares are constantly changing, too. And that's what leads the super excited contestants to constantly repeat the iconic phrase, Big bucks, no whammy, stop! Stop it, oh. But that's not what has Michael's attention. He grabs a piece of paper, draws out the big board, and he starts following the light ring with his finger, jumping from square, square, square. No way. No way it could be that easy. But he has to be sure. So Michael goes to the store and buys a VCR machine. He starts religiously taping Press Your Luck and watching every single episode back to back to back, frame by frame by frame. And then there's that moment when the tickle becomes a certainty. Big bucks, no whammy, stop! Stop it, Holy shit, it's real. The big board isn't random at all. It runs on five different predetermined patterns. And he's right. The Press Your Luck big board was custom made just for the pilot. And it was never guaranteed to be picked up as a show, which meant all of it was done on the cheap. And then the pattern wasn't improved enough when the show went into production. That's the moment. You could feel it, right? The moment that powers everything. But of course, that's not the entire plan. Because right now, all we know is that there is a pattern, right? Okay, great. There's a pattern. But all the whammies are still going to randomly pop up all over the board, right? Unless, unless the prizes and the whammies have to rotate on a predetermined pattern too, right? I mean, I guess there's only one way to find out. No whammy, stop! Stop it, oh. You're shitting me. There it is. There are two squares. Two squares on the board where a whammy never, ever shows up. If you know the five patterns and you know the two spots where no whammy will ever show up, then theoretically, you could keep pressing your luck Forever. At this point of our story, Larson has been married and divorced twice. He's living with his common law wife who 
must be the most patient woman in the entire world considering her boyfriend has a dozen hot-ass TVs running at all day and night. One night, Michael screams for her to come into the living room. He's, quote, playing Press Your Luck by running an old episode on a VCR and hitting the pause button when he knows the light ring is going to land on one of the two safe squares. And he does it over and over and over again. He has the timing down. It is brilliant. He could do this. So Larson makes the decision. He's going to get on this show. He's going to make his moment pay off. He's going to make history. But wait, hold on, hold on. If we put this much thought into what he's going to do on the show, it's probably a good idea to think about how he's going to get on. You can't just walk into the casting director's office and say, hey, I figured out how to beat your game. Please let me take your money. My common law wife thinks I'm brilliant. (laughs) Although that would be amazing. No, you guys know how TV works. You're going to get on one of these shows. You need a story. What do we say? The tableau, all the effort into the first impression. So what's Michael's story? Okay. What do I got here? I'm uh, behind on my bills. Ooh, that's first. LA hotshots probably assume I'm poor the moment I say I'm from Ohio. Ooh, damn. That's an idea. I'll double confirm it by saying I took a bus from Ohio. Whoa. Poor old Rube sitting in a Greyhound for days, watching flyover country drive on by, filling my head with all the winnings I'm going to have when those nice TV people put me on the TV. That's not enough. On Press Your Luck, they always ask, what do you do for a living? Always teachers and salesmen and whatnot. What would be the most pitiful job? AC repairman? True. Got the certificate. In L.A., they probably don't even know what A.C. is. Oh, an ice cream man. Everybody loves an ice cream man. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so we just need one finishing touch. Something that'll pull at the heartstrings. Um, I mean, this one might be too real, but hell, I, I gotta get on the show. I need to buy a gift for my little girl. Her birthday's coming up. I don't have any money. She's so sweet sweet like the ice cream I sell. She deserves the world. Perfect. That's a wrap. Wrapped up in a cheap suit that he insists he bought from a thrift store just down the street. Michael recounts the entire tale to the casting director. There's just one thing he didn't figure on. The other can't-miss element of every Press Your Luck contestant is enthusiasm. Everybody loves the yelling and the screaming and when the big board goes nuts. So picture Michael telling the casting director about his sad, sad life but doing it with a big, broad, energetic smile and electric attitude, jiggling in his seat. I'm pathetic. I sell ice cream. I have 12 televisions and I need to get a present for my daughter. Put me on TV, please. Ha ha. I'm poor, baby. And it's at this moment, the casting director has his own moment. That moment where he knows without knowing That something is off here. So he goes to the producer and he tells him, I think something's off with the super excited poor guy. The producer recounts his conversation like this. Edwards, the senior contestant coordinator, said something about the guy that bothers me. I said, now, Bobby, you and I have been doing this together for years. I mean, come on. I like the guy. You know, we very rarely disagree. I got to overrule you. And it's done. Michael is cast. He's going to be on the very next show. From Television City in Hollywood, it's time to press your luck. 
meet a second player, Michael Larson. How are you, Michael? Now, Michael, what do you do for a living? Oh, I drive an ice cream truck in the summer. I hope to win enough money here not to have to do that do this summer. Do you have it with you today? <laughs> do you have the ice cream truck with you today? No, I didn't. Oh, uh, we had all kinds of orders we were going to take. What a day for it. Well, Michael, you want to earn enough money so you don't have to deal with the ice cream truck. Right. Huh? You just right. want to eat the ice cream, though. No, I've done enough of that, too. <laughs> you kind of OD'd on ice cream, right? Yeah. Well, hopefully you won't OD on money, Michael. Best no. of luck to you. Yeah. And let's... If you've never seen Presser Luck, take a moment to Google it, just so you could visualize this setup. The garish gold colors muted by the camera tech of the 1980s, sitting between his two competitors, Michael. Yeah, it looks mousy in the beginning movements, and it makes sense, because ever since that moment of discovery, everything he's done has led to this proving ground. You don't get cast on a game show twice. Michael has to make this one count. Think about how many hours he spent watching, practicing, selling his sob story, crafting a character. This is his shot. Michael has to make this one count. Soon enough, he answers one of the questions right and he earns himself his first few spins. This is it. Go time. Let's get this money. I'm going stop. He got away. Wait, how, that's not how, how did that not work? The whole plan was about constantly avoiding the whammies. Did, did they change something? Did Michael just screw up? It's got to be what's going through his head right now. Is this all for naught? All of that planning, the practicing, getting out here, the storytelling, the costuming, Michael's not exactly rolling in the dough. Is he about to be the sucker? Was this just an expensive lark? But it can't though, right? Nothing's changed. Why would they spend all the money to update the board? The pattern is the same. It's just the timing difference between sitting on a couch with a VCR and playing for real. But Michael resets. He answers the second round question correct and earns himself some more spins. Then, it happens. Stop! Stop, pick a corner. $2,250. $1,500 in a spin or $2,000, Michael. $2,250. $2,250, you got it, Michael. $28,336, and Michael says, let's go. Oh, no. He's unbelievable. He hits the oh, spot. Oh, Michael. Stop! Four thousand dollars and a spin. And he keeps hitting the spot. And the more he wins, stop! Stop at seven hundred and fifty dollars and a spin. Go again. The louder he gets, the more he wins. The louder the crowd gets, the more he wins. The more his competitors begin to get kind of angry. This is, this is unbelievable. We've never had this happen. Oh, big and the more he wins, the more the host gets worried. Remember, for anybody who doesn't know that Michael knows the secret, all of this money could theoretically go away with just one win. What? I can't say whatever. Here we go. Stop at 500 and a spin. Michael, I've never seen anyone press their luck like you are, and you are pressing Come on. your luck. 52851, and he's going again. Stop! 4,000! Wow. Okay, Michael's going again. I don't have to guess what Michael is thinking as he passes $50,000 in winnings. Here he is in his own words. I went in, I just shoot the moon, so to speak. Um, I, I decided at that point I would go for 100000 $100,000 of early 80s money. And he does it. Go again! 
Stop at 3,000 to spin, Michael. You get it, Michael. You, you're gonna pass him. At one hundred two thousand eight hundred fifty-one dollars, he decides to pass his spins. I don't know if it was fatigue, or maybe he had just proved himself right enough to satisfy the moment. But he was full. Now the others could have their chance to win some money. He got 40 spins on the board without hitting a whammy, of which 37 were for cash. Can you believe it? He did it. It worked. For anyone obsessed with that moment of inspiration, this is the heaven you always strive to return to. Those precious minutes when the itch is finally scratched. God damn it, you were right. Sitting alone in that room when you had that thought, you were right. The drive has subsided, your vision gets wider, the world is brighter. Michael Larson, in that moment, has to be at peace. Or at least probably was until this happens. Those other players, the ones who are pissed off that Michael's dominating the entire game, they start passing their spins to him now, right there at the end of the game. Remember, even if he knows the cheat code at this point, he's only one split second reaction away from either pulling off the heist of the century or leaving with literally nothing. He already hit a whammy once while he was getting used to the game. What if he starts to wobble? What if he starts to lose his groove? One bad move while he's tired could end everything in disaster. Passing them, okay. All right, Michael. Can you handle them? Yeah. All right, here we go. Now, Michael's just trying to refocus and land this plane. But over at the control room of Press Your Luck, everybody is freaking out. They know everything is going totally sideways. They call the producer, Michael Brockman, who says something was very wrong. Here's this guy from nowhere, and he was hitting the bonus box every single time. It was bedlam, I can tell you. And we couldn't stop this guy. He kept going around the board and hitting that box. Step back a moment. Let's look at the business side of what's happening right now. Press Your Luck is owned by CBS. So the prizes get paid directly from the network. More than that, they had no total prize cap. No total prize cap. Larson could have legally continued winning for as long as he wanted. In fact, Larson's streak was already so long, the crew knew they'd have to split this into two episodes, something they'd never done before. Well, what can you do? I mean, there didn't appear to be any cheating. And if they stop the show, the entire day of filming is probably going to be scrapped. I'll have to either hunt for an answer or restart everything, and so they let it ride. Because unlike our story of Dan Enright in 21, the producers here don't really care if a winner goes hog wild. It's not their money getting paid out, it's CBS. Whatever, let the suits handle it. We're making good TV right here. Back to Larson. One final spin to pass again. But he's out of that flow state, that rhythm that he was in. That's it. Game over. Triple zeros on the clock. Get that MVP over here. Let's do the interview. It's so long on time, it doesn't matter. Michael, I understand that you borrowed the money to get here. Yes, sir. You went to a thrift shop to buy a shirt to get on the show. 65 cents. 65 cents for a shirt. I'm sure anybody would give you the shirt off their back right now. Okay, now, Michael, I understand that yesterday was your daughter's birthday? Yes. What happened? I didn't have any money, really, to buy her anything. She's... <laughs> she will get something now. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> like perhaps the state of Tennessee? But you have won at least, I think, three times more than anybody's ever won in the show. Congratulations. Spend it wisely and get your daughter a lovely birthday gift. Okay, thank you. It's been a real treat. Ed, we'll leave you with $11,516. Again, I need... Jamie, to do the Look, man, if you're in the business of doing YouTube and TV stuff, your face is your moneymaker. Guess what? If you exist in society, your face is your moneymaker. Take care of your face. Have good skin. Go and visit our friends over at Geology. 
Geology is a nine-time award-winning men's skincare company recognized in Men's Health, Esquire, and Ask Men Grooming Awards. They got 5,000 plus five-star reviews. People love this stuff. Geology puts together a simple, effective skincare routine customized just for you with ingredients that are proven to work and formulated to use every single day. Their skincare is built around just a handful of powerful, proven ingredients, stuff that has been trusted by dermatologists for decades. Real ingredients like retinol, niacinamide, and kojic acid. They don't do dandelion root extract or sage leaf oil. They'll leave that to the other jokers. Geology is one of the only men's skincare companies to have retinol as an active ingredient in their products. That means they can help you fight acne, reduce oiliness, prevent wrinkles, combat dark or puffy under eyes. And the best part is to get started, you take a simple 30 second quiz. You say exactly what your concerns are. Mine, sometimes I get a little bit shiny. I always need to put powder on my face. I worry about getting all wrinkly so I look too old. Then they put together a personalized skincare regimen just for you. Take care of your face. It's your moneymaker. Skincare is a science. Take the guesswork out of it. You don't want to be gambling. And don't be fooled by the marketing fluff and a list of ingredients like papaya extract from Peru. Spoiler alert, those are fancy marketing words. We're only talking ingredients that actually make a difference on your skin. Start off with a five-piece trial set valued at 50 bucks by heading on over to geology.com slash greatest con. Geology.com slash greatest con. That's G-E-O-L-O-G-I-E dot com slash greatest con. You'll be keeping us in business. You'll be keeping your moneymaker looking good. And most importantly, you'll be taking the guesswork out of the voodoo of skincare. Start with a 30-day trial of all five products. Twice every day face wash, vital morning face cream, repeating night cream, and nourishing eye cream. You get two bottles of the face wash so you can have one in your bag, one in the shower. When you fall in love, continue with 90-day supplies of all the products you dig the most. Subscribe and save or just go a la carte. You're in total control. That's 50% off your 30-day trial at geology.com slash greatest con. The next day, CBS is on Fire. A war room is created in a conference room, and the goal is very, very simple. Figure out how this son of a bitch cheated and how we're going to justify not paying him. This time, it's the CBS execs who are copying Larson's moves, watching the tape back frame by frame during key moments to figure out what his secret was. Larson took Press Your Luck for $110,237. That's $283,000 in today money. Plus, he got trips to the Bahamas, Kauai, and a sailboat. It was the most that anybody had ever won on a single episode of any game show in the history of game shows. Adjusted for inflation, his record still stands. By the numbers, the odds of hitting a whammy are one in six. The same odds as rolling a seven at a craps table. Larson had made 45 spins without crapping out once. It was a statistical impossibility. Larson had beat odds of roughly three out of 10,000. There's something going on. In the war room, the suits begin to pick up on a few key clues. First off, Larson reacts to his wins when the lights around the square are lit and before any of the prizes are settled. It's as if he didn't know what he won, but he knew that nothing bad was going to pop up. And of course, that's exactly the case. Further confirmation was Larson's face after he won a trip to Kauai. That was one of the few times during his run that yes, he did hit something good, but it wasn't one of his two desired squares. Thankfully for him, it was only a trip to paradise, not a whammy. What do the suits got? Nothing. Still, the lawyers want to fight it. Let's withhold payment. And if he wants to go to court, we can offer a settlement. That's until producer Michael Brockman speaks up and asks a very simple question. How did he cheat? He beat the system. This is the moment that CBS was taught a lesson by Professor Michael Larson. 
the CBS pays him his winnings. The only caveat is since he passed 25000 he could not return to the show as a repeat champion as per the tradition. Like all of us would be, Brockman was ashamed of being made the sucker. After airing the two-part episode, he orders the Larson victory to never be run again. Even after selling the show into syndication, he builds into the deal that Larson's episodes could never be played ever. Larson, meanwhile, goes back to Ohio. He's flush with money. He buys his daughter those birthday presents. And then... Well... I guess he waits. He waits for another moment, right? Waits for that tickle. I mean, there's this irascible energy to Michael Larson. It's tempting just to paint him as a rascal who couldn't stop rascaling, you know? You almost want to make excuses for him. The story doesn't end with a rascal experiencing redemption. It ends in humiliation, exile, and a very lonely death. Michael Larson is a junkie and a slave to that moment of inspiration. And it will be the end of him. I don't want to take anything away from how incredible Michael Larson's insights were and how extraordinary his accomplishment was. But the problem is, it's like that moment you figure out that there's a back door to a concert. And the first time you get away with sneaking inside, you feel like this must be how it always is. But you don't realize that the concert that you just broke into was somehow the Beatles reunion, complete with a seance, I guess. Michael Larson snuck in the back door of the greatest concert of all time. But because he did it does not mean he can do it again. As far as he's concerned, there's a back door to every concert. And there's always a way to sneak past the guards. I'm convinced that from this point forward, Michael is a slave to the gambler's fallacy. I believe that he's convinced that no matter how many times he tries, he's always due for the next big win. And it's this conviction that's ultimately going to be his undoing. It's November of 1984. After taxes and a few real estate deals go sideways, Michael ends up with around $50,000. It's at this moment he hears about a contest on the radio. They would read a random string of numbers each day. If you happen to have a $1 bill with the same serial number on it, you could bring it in and win $30,000. Statistically, that's a pretty safe bet for the radio station. Unless you're broadcasting anywhere Michael freaking Larson can hear you, who happens to be sitting on $50,000 that he could change into $1 bills and consult every single day until, inevitably, in his mind, he's got to win. And that's exactly what he does. So each afternoon, he gets his common-law wife to go through the bills with him. She gets tired of this crap pretty fast, but damn... This is 30000 more dollars. The winning bills have to be in here somewhere. You just need to find it. So he does it. He puts the money in shoe boxes all over the house. Each day he recruits his wife to help him look through the bills to see if they can find the magic number. Day after day, the numbers are called on the radio. Day after day, they pull out the shoe boxes. Day after day, their stupid fingers are touching 50,000 stupid $1 bills. And day after day, they don't have the magic number. For weeks and weeks and weeks, they do this. After weeks of this, Larson is reluctantly pulled away to go to a Christmas party. His common-law wife, she's had enough. She wants to go out get them to clear their mind. He's earned it after all. This was the biggest year of his life. 
He won over $100,000 for being smarter than all of smug TV Hollywood land. We already know the new plan is foolproof. It's just going to take some time to get $30,000 more. Come on, man, let's go. Merry Christmas, Michael Larson. And it might have been a Merry Christmas. Maybe. If somebody hadn't found out that this dude withdrew $50,000 in $1 bills. If they didn't know he was keeping it just laying around his house. If they didn't watch him leave for the party. If they didn't break in and steal all $50,000 every last one imagine being back to square one having gone from a hundred thousand dollars in your hands to nothing within one calendar year he screams at his wife loses it she gets scared she leaves with the kids tells them to move out but michael knew the truth michael was gonna get that money back It was the last thing he did. Really the best price on Kodak film? You're not at Walmart. At Walmart, a 24 exposure roll of Kodak 135 print film is just $268 every day. And you'll always Michael's back to square one. Might as well start stacking up the TVs again. Just waiting for that next moment. That next moment that's going to power his next chance to get it right. He never had a problem making the money. See, the last disaster, that was about keeping it. Maybe lightning could strike twice. Larson calls on the producers of Press Your Luck to stage a tournament of champions for a chance to make a big score one more time. The producers politely decline. So Larson waits some more. Reads the newspaper, scanning for inspiration, watches TV, looking for a spark, listens to the radio, ready for his next mission. But it wasn't meant to be. Not then, at least, and rent was due. Michael eventually takes a job as an assistant manager at Walmart. Ten years go by. And then it happens. He feels that tickle, that familiar tickle in the back of his mind. In 1994, Michael is reading USA Today. He sees an ad for a marketing opportunity. The company that placed the ad is Pleasure Timeline, a 1-900 hotline. It's a 1-900 hotline company that specializes in betting information and, of course, phone sex. But they had an idea for a different business model. One that could take advantage of the 90s in a way that had never been done before. Leveraging the paper call technology, widespread credit card adoption, faxes, and yes, the nascent world of the internet. Pleasure Timeline teams up with Michael to start a worldwide lottery. One that anybody can enter just by calling the 1-900 number to, quote, buy tickets. I mean, at least... That's the pitch. Who knows if anybody really thought this was possible. Gambling laws are notoriously fickle in America, and setting up something like this without assurances is either insanely stupid or out-and-out fraud, or both. Michael's brought on to recruit the seed money for the lottery, so he sends faxes out to businesses and starts posting on internet message boards casting the widest possible net so that potential investors know what awaits them. Quote, Without exception, the most lucrative income possibilities ever devised for the average person. At least that's what the marketing material said. People would call the number, a phone would ring in an Ohio boiler room. Answering the phone, one Michael Larson. Of course this is legit. Are we going to make it happen? We're partnering with a Native American tribe that has the rights to gamble. I mean, the ink isn't dry yet, but between you and me, the Maliseet tribe of Fulton, Maine is going to work with us. You don't want to be a loser for the rest of your life, do you? An AC repairman? What, an ice cream salesman wearing a schlubby suit? Trust me, I'm rich, baby. Oh, I, 
Did I mention that I can make even more money if you recruit a few friends? See, their earnings pay out to you in our downline system. For the record, I cannot think of a more 90s scam than this. We got fax machines, we got 900 numbers, we got multi-level marketing horseshit. The only way this could be more 90s is if he was doing all this while wearing hammer pants and a corn t-shirt. The American Indian Lottery raised $1.8 million from 14,000 investors before being shut down by the SEC in 1995. When the charges were announced... Bob Burson, an SEC lawyer based in Chicago, says, To my knowledge, this is the first case we've ever brought where the internet has been used as a marketing tool. Think about that. Ever the pioneer, Michael Larson, this might be the world's first investigated fraud on the internet. Unfortunately for Michael Larson... This is the first major internet fraud being investigated by the SEC and the FBI. I mean, you could guess where it goes from here, right? The closer, the tighter that noose gets, the slipperier Michael becomes eventually disappearing from this mortal plane, and he ends up in that ethereal world where all con men eventually go. Florida. And of course, once he gets to Florida, he can't stay well behaved. Eventually gets arrested on unrelated charges. So we have our last bit of contact with Michael Larson. A phone call to his newest girlfriend from a Fort Lauderdale jail. Michael's hot hand had run out. There in Florida, he died penniless of throat cancer. Or did he die of that addiction? Did he die because he couldn't give up the hunger for that spark, that tickle, that chance to stick one to the man? I think we've all had a case of it. Even as he died, I have to imagine he was looking for an angle to pull off Just one more twist. Or maybe he had truly gotten past it. Maybe as he lay dying, he was able to smile, think about his misadventures, and think to himself, I did it. I pulled it off. I just might be the world's greatest con. This episode of World's Greatest Con was written by Justin Robert Young and me, Brian Brushwood, your humble host. Production and research by Dog and Pony Show Audio in Austin, Texas. And credit to the Tampa Tribune, Associated Press, and The Hollywood Reporter. The Game Show Network and their documentary, Big Bucks, The Press Your Luck Scandal. The FBI and SEC for information on the case against Pleasure Time, Inc., which, along with other contemporary news articles, retrospectives, and archived video, made for the bulk of our research. Additional research by Rachel Oppenheimer. Of course, you have questions, and we want to answer them all at the end of the season, so get yours in by hitting us up at worldsgreatestcon at gmail.com. In the next episode of World's Greatest Con, a respected military major finds himself in the hot seat of one of the most popular game shows to ever air on television, only to find himself stumped by the questions in front of him. Faced with losing out on potentially hundreds of thousands of dollars, he comes up with a plan so dumb, so outrageous, there's no way it can work. And the worst part? It totally does. That's next time on World's Greatest Con. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) Dog and Pony Show Audio.